All right, welcome back. My name's Ryan Heldon. I'm a landscape, uh, wildlife, and action photographer here in uh, Sydney, Australia. And I thought I'd do an update on uh, my experience with the Canon R3, uh, as well as not really comparing it, but sort of the pitfalls between uh, the Canon R3 and the Sony A1, which um, Sony Alpha Pro Support here in Australia was kind enough to lend me for, for three weeks. Uh, unfortunately, it's got to go back tomorrow, but uh, it's been fun having it. It's the second time I've used the A1. I, uh, I only had it for a couple of days uh, last year, but I got a lot more time with it uh, this time around. And uh, I thought I'd sort of do an update based on my on, from my first um, video. Um, I'm sure you, you're used to seeing plenty of videos come out from all the, the camera reviewers, and they usually put them out so fast that... Um, a lot of them just put them out just for the sake of putting them out to be first out or be sort of, I know it's their job and like YouTube at the end of the day comes down to viewings and if something's brand new and popular, it's going to attract more views. So I totally understand that standpoint from getting it out. But I think a lot of them don't really spend significant amounts of time with, um, with the cameras uh, to really give it a, a just review and, uh, and make sure that... Um, from a user experience long term, uh, it sends the right, I won't say the wrong information, but sends the right sort of user experience overall, uh, having put it through its paces properly. That's not to say that there aren't some wonderful reviews done out there very quickly, um, but I thought I'd give you a long term, well, it's kind of long term. I've had the R3 since, uh, since Christmas, so it's been two months now. Um, and how it stacks up against the, the Sony system. Uh, I've been a long time Sony user as I demonstrated in my last video for over seven years now. Uh, started with the A7S II, went to the A7R III, then the A9, and I sort of talked about in that video about the pitfalls of um, my experiences with Sony, uh, mainly being around ergonomics and how much I was interested in, in having a look at the R3 based from an ergonomic standpoint and just trying something new. Um, but yeah, that being said, let's get into a couple of the, the things that I definitely don't think get mentioned that much in reviews uh, from a user experience, how you live with it day in, day out, etc. So the first one I'm going to start with, and I'm going to, try, I'm going to try and get this as organic as possible, is the Canon cameras are a little bit behind when it comes to metering. Now, I believe the 1DX Mark III is a little bit different, but on all Sony cameras, I can assign metering to the AF point, which means if I'm, if I assign it to the AF point and I focus on the face, it meters for the face and forgets everything else in the scene. So that can be quite valuable when you don't care if a window behind someone blows out or you're, you're shooting someone backlit. But on the Canon, you can't do that. Um, you get pretty good results with the metering, but if you're shooting someone backlit or you're shooting someone sort of on a 45 degree angle to get the face and the, there's a big window behind them, say you're shooting inside, of course, um, the images can become quite muddy unless you use exposure compensation to make sure you get a properly exposed face. You don't have to worry about exposure compensation on the Sony's if you've got the metering attached to the focus point, which you can't do on the R3. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure you can do it on the 1DX Mark III. Um, so people say, well, just use exposure compensation. Now, I talked about exposure compensation in my last video, how I feel Canon sort of, and this isn't, once again, this isn't just the R3. Um, Exposure compensation, there's a dedicated button for, but it's not exposure compensation in all modes, manual being one of those modes. So there you have to work around that, of course, and I express my interests about like if a button is assigned as a button, it should act as that assign for no matter what mode you're in. So the metering is also a little bit slower on the Canon when moving between dark, say once again, inside you're moving from a dark corner and you're sort of panning and it's going into backlit areas with windows. It can be quite slow as well as, not that you would ever use auto white balance when you're shooting inside, the white balance is a lot slower on the Canons to adjust and react compared to the Sony A1 in this particular instance. So. I thought that was uh, quite interesting to note, and I thought, well, 
if you're be aware of don't shoot in auto um uh auto white balance if you're indoors and you're moving between brights and 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 dark areas uh and that the metering for shooting backlit subjects is not as good on the on the canon because you cannot assign it to the af point yet um as of where I, it's the 28th of february 2022 so um let's move on to the next thing um all right something that <laughs> it's a nothing thing but i find it invaluable formatting oh on the canons it's it's so quick it's so good doesn't matter whether you're formatting the the cf express type b card or an sd card formatting on the canon cameras is just so much faster than it is on the on the sony's the sony's it doesn't matter if i'm using the sd or the cf express type a they take five to six times longer to format now you might be talking like three seconds versus 10 seconds but you know it's just one of those things if you're formatting cards all the time it's you're just sitting around sort of waiting for it all the time so i just thought i'd, I'd share that with you as well all right vertical grips now the the canon as you all know comes with the vertical grip built in the sony one is an add-on and not a cheap add-on either but uh in the hands, I've got big hands. So I've mentioned that my, my hands are a, uh, a Hestra size 11 in the last one, if anyone was curious as to hand size. Now I can hold the A1 four fingers very comfortably, but like I expressed in the, the first video, my distance is, my problem's always been the distance between the lens mount and the end of the, the grip. But the A1 does feel significantly better in the hand than the old A7R3 and the A9s. The grip's a lot more beefier. Um, I can get away with it nearly all the time, but if I'm shooting in colder climates, I could probably only wear a, a, a merino, like a, um, a base layer glove or a liner, or I'd have to use one of my mitt gloves where I can uh, fold back uh, the covers so my fingers are exposed so I can actually grip the camera properly. If I needed to use a thick thick glove, the Sony's just not going to... It's, it's just not as good as the Canon. But I thought what would be nice and interesting to sort of discuss as well is how does the normal grip feel with the portrait grip in terms of is it how close is it to feeling the same? Like at the end of the day, continuity and congruency is, is a big thing when it comes to muscle memory so the the canon what you will notice when you pick the canon up is that the shutter button on the portrait grip is quite a bit off center to towards the the outside of the body compared to when you use it in the standard grip it's almost it's almost a uh, directly behind your af on button but in the portrait grip uh it's it's almost like instead of being, say, uh, at the moment, it'd be just a bit past 12 o'clock. It's almost at 1.30, 2 o'clock. So it's a little bit different, but it does feel almost like roughly about the same distance between your thumb and index finger. On the Sony, on the other hand, you're a lot closer. So when you go from standard grip to the vertical grip, you're index finger is a lot closer back towards your AF on button. But at the same time, the distance is, uh, the, the, the orientation is a lot more spot on. So say if you're at 12 and 12 on the normal, on the normal grip, you'd be at 12 and 12 on the, on the vertical grip as well. So at the end of the day, it's only gonna come down to preference. And once you use something, you won't notice a difference until you pick up a different camera. Uh, but if you're looking for continuity, they both have their pros, they both have their cons. Uh, something that I thought was interesting, because a lot of people like to, uh, you know, shoot one-handed now. The Sony for my hands is actually easier to shoot one-handed if I would need to. Um, you see uh, quite often uh, as sports and, and wildlife photo photographers, especially sports photographers using two cameras, uh, they'll be holding one while over the top of a crowd or trying to get like a, a winner's shot or something um, and they'll be shooting one hand. For my hands, the way the Canon grip is set up on the, the, the well, what would be the bottom of your normal orientation, it has this lump 
where the 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 shutter button uh well i have it for shutter my i use uh, aperture pro, aperture on the on the front dial and shutter on the back dial um there's this bump there which means when i hold it with one hand that bump takes all the load now that can actually get quite painful with my hands if i'm holding it for extended periods of time but because all that load is going through that back end it's it wants to sort of move out and it's hard especially like the smart controller you'd almost have to just not have it as the as a movable smart controller but just basically as an af on button because you'll find it very hard to sort of keep um, a good grip on the top half of the camera. Again, this is my hands. I have quite large hands. So if you've got smaller hands, you'll probably fit in the grooves a lot better than myself. But I have large hands, which is why I gravitate towards cameras that have grips on them. Again, just my user experience. Uh, your mileage may vary, but I just thought it was something easy, something um, important to note for, for people who are looking at either system. All right, so I'm going to touch on autofocus again because um, a couple of things that I, I said in the first video were were still, and I still believe in them very much so, uh, but after spending more time with the Canon R3, I can see a, um, a use case scenario for so many different cases, um, but I still stick by my original sentiments where if you're looking for a lock and load, easy to change on the fly, the Sony's a better autofocusing system for your ability to change settings quickly. Now, what do I mean by that? On the Sony's, I can set whether it's locked on or responsive or somewhere in between very quickly because I can assign it to the quick func to the function menu and I can just basically press the function menu, choose the um, AF, uh, locked on menu speed and then just quickly use the wheel. On the Canons you can't assign cases or the ability to adjust cases to the quick menu and you can't assign it to a button which means every time you need to make changes to a case or even change a case you have to go into the quick function men uh, you have to actually go into Canons menus to do that. Now that being said this camera is marketed at a photojournalist or a sports photographer or a wildlife photographer generally they're not aimed it's not really aimed at someone who does like all three or wants all types of photography so basically i can understand how the cases will be a lot more proficient for someone who is purely a sports shooter because what they could do then is they could have different cases assigned to basically the same camera settings that they'd use but have different cases for different custom shooting modes. So they might always shoot at 1 3200th of a second wide open, uh, but they want to use case one in one on in custom one, and then they'll have case two in custom two, or they'll use case three or have auto for their for their custom three shooting mode. Or even still, they might only use case two, but then have different variations of case two assigned to different custom shooting modes which would be very valuable and all you'd have to do was push the uh, multi-function button which was what I have assigned to changing my shooting modes um, which would be like once again it is marketed not to sort of like a jack of all trades um, uh, shooter it's marketed that you would be either one or the other which I can see how the cases would be better so if you are only a sports shooter maybe for your use case scenario that a, a camera like the Canon R3 might be better suited for you. But if you're sort of someone who shoots a bit of sports, uh, a bit of wildlife, um, some landscapes, some portraits, the Sony probably will be a better option for you for, not only for say, because you've got more resolution, uh, more megapixels, but the user experience is a lot easier and faster to change. And you could have say a, custom shoot once again you got three custom shooting modes on the a1 so you could have one for wildlife one for sports one for portraits or whatever so and then if you needed to adjust each one of the um, uh, focus locked on or focus responsive in either of those custom shooting modes you can do it very quickly from the function menu as opposed to on the canon having to go into the canon menus to change it so uh, again something that will be important for some of you but not be important for others uh 
we're not really going to touch on the megapixel race here because look at the end of the day if you know you need 50 if you need 50 megapixels you already know it if you crop a lot then you want a high resolution you'd be looking at 50 megapixels with the sony a1 or get the r5 at 45 megapixels if you only need 24 and you like a lighter workload or a, a workflow don't want to take up too much um uh uh, too much storage space because well, storage is getting cheaper and cheaper these days. But still, from a workflow standpoint, the 24 megapixel files are 23 megabytes, whereas the compressed A1 50 megapixel photos are 56 megabytes. Now, that being said, I did mention in the first video that I didn't, I hadn't actually noticed any difference between the uncompressed photos from the Sony A1 or the um, the lossless. Uh, uncompressed photos from the Sony A1 and I still can't really see a difference but what I have noticed was I used the A1 in the 30 frames per second using the uh, the compressed format and I noticed a big difference in the ability to recover highlights in compressed versus uncompressed and lossless uncompressed so for me, my use case scenario, I don't really need 30 frames a second. I'm happy with the, the 20 frames a second I get in uncompressed or lossless compressed. I will generally shoot, uh, if I'm shooting fast action, in the lossless uncompressed. And then for anything like landscapes or uh, for slow moving portraits, I'll have it in, uh, in the uncompressed. But yeah, with the compressed file format, I found that I lost the ability to bring highlights back to a significant degree, well, maybe not a significant degree, but it was noticeable in my particular workflow. All right, so one thing you'll notice straight away with the, the Canon R3 is the distance that the eyepiece is off the back. Now, this can be a pro and a con. Um, in terms of packing, uh, it means that it's it's gonna take up more room in any, uh, in any bag. Um, but another good thing is it means you don't have your cheek smashed up against the, the LCD screen on the cameras. Um, which means you're forever not having to clean them either, which is, and granted, even on the R3, you can, you can turn the, the screen around. And that being said, the screen on the R3 is, well, it's light and day compared to the, um, compared to the Sony A1 or any of the Sonys. Uh, I think a lot of Sony A1 owners will feel very cheated out there that, that this has such a, a rubbish, um, LCD screen on the back, whether it was flippy or not. I find, especially when I'm shooting from low angles, I always have to pull the LCD screen all the way out because to get past the eyepiece. But um, look, once again, user preference. And uh, I, I, like I said, I think a lot of A1 owners would be pretty disappointed that the, the newer uh, evolutionary version of the A7R4 came out with a, with a better uh, resolution LCD screen, which is still, once again, it's light, it's half the resolution of the uh, LCD on the back of the um, of the, the of the R3. Uh, talking about that as well, viewfinders, I mentioned in my first video, there's no real difference in comparing them because if you're shooting the R3 at 120 um, uh, refresh rate, rate um, you're at 5.7, 5.8 million dots. Uh, even though the A1 EVF has a 9.44 million dot, that's only at 60 uh, refresh rate. If you go to 120, it brings it down to 5.76 million. So they're basically on par. But I will say the shooting experience, the LCD in the Canon feels a lot more natural. Uh, it, just, it just looks better. Um, but then again, on the flip side of that, I do prefer the green focus box as opposed to the blue focus dot. So once again, it's just a, a personal preference. Um, but I don't think you can go wrong with either of them. They're both wonderful EVFs. Um, what I have found though, is you need to use manual uh, brightness on both of them because in dark scenarios, you'll get a, almost it almost feels like a false reading. Um, it, you'll be, you'll feel like you're exposed way too bright on the, on the, on both cameras i haven't noticed it so much on the sony but on the canon it'll give me a almost like a, a, an overexposed uh viewing experience through the, the evf so i just set it on manual and i usually just put it one above uh normal uh but i usually do the same on the sony's all right so i mentioned this in the last video but um 
the AF on button on the on the back of the Canon is amazing. The the infrared sensor on the back to be able to uh, just uh, it's amazing. It, it's so much better than using a joystick, and it's almost worth the price of admission. Um, yeah, it's just it's it's an absolute joy to use. Whether you're just using it as an AF on button or or you're using it to move around your focus point. Uh, I generally will use a single point focus point or I'll use a modified zone. Um, but yeah, it's, it's <laughs> it, it, like I said, it's almost worth the price of admission. It was on the 1DX Mark III, which was really good to use. Uh, and also um, the customization of being able to sh set up different shooting modes on the Canon is also really good. You can do almost exactly the same on the on the sony but there's a couple of limitations on the sony compared to the canon once again i can assign a different case with a different set of settings to say the asterisk button uh, and only have it that instead of it being people detect it's uh it's animal detect um and at a different case at the same time which is which is brilliant which means the the the, the plethora of different shooting custom modes is exponentially expanded. Uh, another good thing about the Canon over the Sony is you essentially have six custom shoot modes. So you have three for photo and three for video, whereas on the Sony, you either choose three video or three photo or a combination of both. Uh, I know on the A7 IV, you now have the option to have three in both because the toggle switch is on the bottom of the um, of the mode dial. But having the switch on the back of the camera is even faster and much better. Um, once again, it's just a preference. It's almost like, could you take both cameras and just create like a, <laughs> a Canon Sony love child and I think you'd have the perfect camera. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty much been my, my user experience using both cameras, uh, side by side for, for three weeks straight. Um, uh, a, a nice, well, it's a nothing thing. Once again, once you do something for long enough, it doesn't matter, but I like, even though for a lot of people, they say they have problems with, because of the, like I said at the beginning, I have problems with space between the lens mount and the, the grip. Uh, people have said, oh, they sometimes push the, the lens release mount button and lenses fall off. It, I've never had that issue. But I actually do prefer where it is on the Sony's because I can just leave my hand where it is, change lenses, back up to the eye and shoot. Whereas on the Canon, I have to go from my normal shooting hand position, put it in the other hand, and then take it off. Um... Once again, once you do it a certain amount of time, but then once again, I've got to swap it back to my shooting hand again. It's just, it's a little thing, but it's something if you've got to do it, if you're changing lenses all the time, it's something you'll notice, especially if you're you're chopping between, like I have been for the last three weeks between two different cameras, you start to really pick up on these things. Um, along with that, I find the Canon lenses are, well, the way the RF mount is set up, the Sony lenses are a lot easier to put on and take off. Um, maybe it's just because the the white dot, like, and it's on a slight angle, it's about like, instead of being right at the top like the Canons are, it's at about 130, so it's easy to see. You don't have to bring your, your eye over the top of it. But also all the RF glass, the, 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 the line is tiny and it's red and it's quite hard to see in contrast to, to the, the color of the, the camera and the lens. I just, once again, your mileage will vary, and if you do it enough times, muscle memory is not going to matter. But I think the combination of having, without having to change my hand position to change a lens, and having a white dot that's nice and easy to see, it's just, it's it's seamless. Granted, once again, I've done it a lot more on the Can on the Sony's than I have on the Canons, but once again, I have to change my hand position, change, put it on, and then I have to change my hand position again, and it just seems like. It's user preference. Look, we'll put it down to that, but I thought it was something that someone might be interested in knowing. Uh, 
other than that, I think it's all pretty square. If, if I've missed anything, please leave it in the, the comments. If you haven't watched the, the first video, I go into a lot more detail about um, image quality, etc. Of course, I wasn't comparing the A1 at the time. Um, the 50 megapixel sensor on the A1 is, it's astounding. Uh, if you're, like I said, if you, if you need 50 megapixels, you know it already. If you crop a lot of your photos, you you know that you need 50 or the Canon R5, 45 megapixels. But if you've got the lenses that you don't have to worry about cropping, it's pretty hard to go past the R3. Um, 24 megapixels, like I said, very workable files, um, not gonna take a lot of storage, uh, makes it easier when you do your editing. Uh, previews come up a lot quicker. Um, swapping between Lightroom and Photoshop uh, is faster. Uh, not by much, but it's it's noticeable. All right, so let's do a little bit of a sum up. Look, I really like the Canon R3. I really enjoy the shooting experience. I like the way it feels in the hand. I like the way it looks. Um, 24 megapixels is enough for most people. Uh, do I wish it had more? Absolutely. Uh, but as I said in the first video, it's not my number one gripe. My number one gripe has always been... Uh, that Canon still can't implement a, an auto minimum ISO shutter speed of less than a second, uh, which if you're a time-lapse photographer, uh, like I, I do a lot of time-lapses where we go from afternoon camping setups into night, into astro. Um, on the Sonys, I can set, say, uh, in aperture priorities, F2, uh, an auto minimum ISO shutter speed of 15 seconds, have an interval of of 20 seconds um, and have a maximum ISO set to 3200. So in the early part of the time lapse, it might be at a hundredth of a second because of the light, but uh, as the light diminishes, it'll gradually decrease the shutter speed all the way up to 15 seconds before it starts to raise the ISO. You can't do that on the Canon. The Canon will only let you go to one second and then you have to, uh, and then of course the ISO will start to creep up. And then when the ISO reaches the predetermined uh, highest ISO setting that you've set in the camera, then it will start to drag the shutter speed. But here's where you have to be careful as well. If you're using the Canon cameras in this regard, in this method, you also have to go into the orange menu and select your... Um, mechanical shutter speed to not exceed say in this particular example 15 seconds because otherwise it'll keep dragging longer to 30 seconds even though your interval might be set to 20 seconds so it's a lot of work it's extra settings you have to change but the worst thing is you're getting one second exposures but at 3200 iso so you're getting a lot noisier images a lot earlier on in your time lapse as opposed to well let's do the math on the sony one second at 3200 ISO on the Canon is equivalent to uh, eight second exposure at 200 ISO. So much cleaner images, much earlier on in the time lapse versus on the Canon, much noisier images early on in the time lapse before it decides to drag the shutter. So it's almost like, I understand why Canon still hasn't changed it. Well, I don't understand why they still haven't changed it, but I understand why, why it's implemented that way originally it's back from the dslr days when there was no ibis in the cameras and canon pretty much determined that no one can handhold in aperture priority longer than a second for a single shot so but this is the mirrorless age we now have well eight stops of ibis which again the eight stops in ibis in this especially if you're using a long telephoto like a like a 400 or a 600 or even the 100 to 500 is night and day better than the 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 sony and the good thing about, like I mentioned in the first video, the Canon, you can actually assign that IBIS to be on all the time or just when you push the, the AF button. On the Sony's, it only turns on when you push the AF button, which don't get me, I might be wrong on this. I've never actually really gone in depth and tested this in video, um, but I'd imagine the IBIS would be on all the time in video in, it, it is on the Canon for sure, but I'm not sure about the Sony uh, because generally you're not using 
your autofocus button in, in video, you're letting the camera decide autofocus based on your zones and subject matter like we are just now. Um, but yeah, I want, look, <laughs> for me being a Sony shooter for the last seven years, I wanted the underdog to be better. I really did. And in many ways it is, in many ways. But for me, because I'm not just a sports shooter or I'm not just a journalist shooter or I'm not just a wildlife shooter, I like to, I essentially want one camera to do nearly everything. The A1 is a better camera for doing everything. Does it have its pitfalls? Yes, we've discussed many of them over the last two videos. But for my user experience, for my needs, it's a better camera. For, for, for me, if the Canon was 40 megapixels and they fixed the, um, the auto minimum ISO shutter speed, I would grab the Canon every day of the week. It's just, it's just the way it is. Um, like I said, it's, it's, it'd be like if you could take these two cameras and like have a Sony Canon love child, I think that, uh, I think that would be your perfect camera. Um, but then again, you'll always find something wrong with it, won't you? Uh, there's always something that <laughs> that's missing or not there. So unfortunately, I think the Canon's going to find its way onto the used market. I think I'm going to sell my R3 and my A9 and pick up an A1, uh, the user experience. And once again, like I said in the first video, I'm heavily invest invested in Sony Glass. Um, but I would have been happy to have sold all my Sony gear and transitioned to, to Canon RF. Um, but like I said, for me personally, I do a lot of time lapses, especially motion control. So a lot of you guys saying, oh, are you shoot in manual when you do time lapses. On some motion control, that's not a feasible option. Uh, last thing you want to be doing is touching a camera on a moving system. Um, especially something like if you're using a, a syrup slingshot or something that's, that's running on three axis. Um, but yeah, so that's been my user experience for both cameras. Uh, the, I shot them, like I said, I shot them side by side for almost three weeks, shooting them every day. Uh, 23,000, 22 and a half thousand odd photos on the A1 in that three week period and about 17,000 on the, um, uh, on the R3, which I found was funny because I was always shooting roughly at, uh, especially when I was doing the action stuff, I was shooting at 30 frames a second. Uh, whereas on the Sony, majority of the time, even though I tested out the, the compressed raw format at 30 frames a second and the other couple of settings that you have to change, um, I didn't like the results that I was getting from, like I said, with the highlights, being able to recover the highlights. So I just shot in the lossless compressed, getting 20 frames a second, took a lot more photos, well, an extra four or 5,000. Uh, photos on the on the A1. Um, but yeah, I hope this has helped. Uh, if you've got any questions, leave them in the comments below. Those who went to comment on the last photo, uh, on the last video I did, uh, comparing the R3 to the, the Sony system, I apologize. Uh, for some reason, I set the one of the settings to uh, children's viewing, so you can't comment on that sort of stuff. I won't make that mistake again. Uh, but yeah, any questions, put them in the comments below. I know a lot of people actually asked me about the eye control. All right, so what I'll touch on very quickly with the eye control, uh, I'm having problems with near sight nowadays. So I do wear glasses, but I don't need glasses to, to, to take photos and to shoot. But what I did find with the, with the R3 is you need a lot of ambient light around your eye when you're putting your eye up to actually do the calibration in the first place. As you can see, like you think this room's actually pretty well lit, but if I try and do a calibration now, it won't calibrate 90% of the time. The other thing I found, and of course, I think this will change as you use it more and more often, is I was getting a lot of eye strain. Now, I already suffer from eye strain because, well, I'm losing my nearsightedness. Um, but I just found using it, looking around, trying to, and then adjusting where my focus point was, it does feel natural, but it feels like you're trying to use your eye too much. And with the smart control on the back, I still find even the smart control is just so much faster. Um, and you don't sort of have to coordinate your eye with the, with the AF on button uh, at the same time. And you don't have to remember, oh shit, I've got to take my finger off the AF button to re 
um, reactivate eye control. Because remember, when you use the eye control, you use your eye to choose a focus point, and then you push the AF button, and then it'll start stay on that AF point that you selected, or it'll start tracking depending on your settings. Um, if you want to switch, you've got to take your thumb off and then look at something else and then push it on again, which is similar to how you'd use the AF and smart controller in a, if you were just using that on its own, but it's a lot quicker just to use it on its own, in my experience anyway. So I didn't get a lot of success using the uh, eye control, um, but I can see that there's a lot of... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It it does have a bright future down the road. I think it, 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 it this well, it's technically the second iteration of eye control. I think possible firmware updates as well as uh, succession models with with better versions and better uh, uh, better detection uh, in terms of. Uh, see where, knowing where your iris is in the viewfinder, uh, better sensors, so to speak. Um, I think it'll improve drastically. But at the moment, for my use case scenario and my experience so far, it's been hit and miss and half the time is getting past the calibration phase. Uh, but if you are using it, as long as you've got plenty of, you've got a, uh, you're shooting outdoors in a bright scene and you've got plenty of ambient light when you're actually doing the calibration, I think you'll be fine. Um, but yeah, at the moment for me, I think it's still one of those things that it's nice to have that you'll never really use. Um, but yeah, I hope that, once again, I hope this has helped. I hope you got a lot out of this. Um, get out there and get shooting. It doesn't matter what uh, system you're using, use the system that's going to work for you. And on that, we'll see you next time. Thank you.